This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at reactroundup.com slash kendo UI. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Roundup. This week on our panel, we have Corey House. Hi there, everybody. Nader Dabit. Hello. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. And this week, we have a special guest, and that's Yuho. I'll try not to completely slaughter your last name. Uh, Vepsalainen. Yeah, it's uh, close enough. Yuho uh, Vepsalainen. It's one of the Finnish names that nobody can pronounce, but it's somewhere. Thank you. Awesome. Now, um, I, I invited you to the show. Basically, uh, you're one of the speakers at the upcoming React Dev Summit. In fact, if, if people want to yeah, use, correct. use your link to sign up, uh, they can. And that's just Yuho. That's your first name. J-U-H-O. Um, and, yeah, uh, yeah you, you'll get a cut of that. And, uh, I, I believe it was 10% off is, is what I set that up as. So, you know, if you want, if you want the paid ticket. If you want to come and just attend for free, you can, um, but it's only available live for free. You you won't get the recordings. Um, you know, eventually they'll come out on YouTube, but probably not for six months or so. So anyway, we brought you on to talk about Webpack, the good parts. Uh, do you want to uh, correct? Do you want to give us kind of an yeah. elevator pitch on that, like so, what, it, what it's about and how it all works? So I mean, the thing is, uh, I found Webpack like let's say four years ago. Uh, it didn't make any sense uh, when I found it. Uh, then I found React.loader. I was one of the first users of React.loader. Uh, and then it started to make sense because I adapted this hot loading thing and then I, I really had to learn Webpack. And then I started collaborating with uh, Christian Forney and then we started writing a book and then I wrote a book about the topic. So uh, what, what happened in, in essence is that I, I self-published a book about Webpack. And the point point is that uh, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to make the complex tool a little simpler to understand. So there's a quite big book uh, and the presentation itself, it's going to like condense uh, everything I figured out about the tool in, in these four years. So it's like a really, let's say, fast overview on, on Webpack and its capabilities on, on what, you, what you can do with the tool. So what's the name of the book? Uh, it's just a uh, survival.js webpack. So I have the book. Uh, the book itself is online. So if you go survival.js.com, you can find my React book and, and webpack book and my maintenance book. Uh, it's all freely available. But of course, uh, it's good if people buy the books. Because it means that I can, I can develop the content. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, just, uh, it's online. So Survive JS, I feel like I've read this. Has this been out for quite a bit, or is this like something that's been put out recently? I feel like I may have seen this like when I first yeah, saw it. Yeah, back. Yeah, it, it has been out for a while. But what what I do every once in a while is that I, I just update the book. So now it's an on Webpack three, and what needs to happen next? I have to do the updates for Webpack four. So even like it was like let's say six months ago i split the book i realized that it's, it's too big like nobody can can read like 400 pages so i i i split split it up i split up the maintenance book out of it and, and i expanded on the content so i guess this is the way i write so i write stuff then i realized i wrote too much then i split the book so now the webpack book is it's a little slimmer it's easier to, easier to get into so it's this like process or whatever i don't write books like normal people <laughs> so like when I think of Webpack, I automatically think of React. Can you kind of talk about like how someone may get into like learning about Webpack if they're not, you know, coming from a React background? I know most of our listeners are, but kind of it seems like Webpack is capable of doing so much more stuff, I guess you'd say. Can you kind of go into yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the biggest thing, biggest obstacle, it, it has to do with with the concepts. Uh, if, if you understand the concepts behind Webpack, you will understand the tool much better. Because when you come to, when you come to the tool, it doesn't make much 
sense because it's like full of these new terms that don't make any sense. But once you understand the meaning, once you understand why these concepts exist, exist in the tool, uh, then you start understanding the tool itself. And this is the one reason why when we, re when we redesigned the site of Webpack, we created a new section just about concepts. So you go to the Webpack site, uh, you read through the concept, concept section, uh, and it begins to make more sense. Uh, because once you understand the language we speak within the tool, uh, you can actually understand the documentation. And this is something that was missing from the original documentation. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's valuable to just to get into the concepts first. Once you get the ideas behind the tool, it makes so much more sense. Now, you, Nader, you mentioned that uh, when you think about Webpack, you think about React. But uh, currently, it is also the default uh, system behind the Angular CLI and a, a lot of the other systems out there, too. So it definitely does more than just React. But yeah, I think most people listening to this show are going to be at least somewhat familiar with the React ecosystem and make that same association. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But uh, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's not coupled with React. It's just right. happened that... Uh, because React got popular, Webpack got popular in the in the process, and because Webpack got popular, then other other tools, other, I mean other frameworks and everything, they just adopted Webpack because it became popular. So it's this this cycle. So you get popular in some domain, and then others notice, oh, there's this great tool. Let's let's use this. So it's like, uh, yeah. So React, let's say React popularized, React made Webpack really popular, uh, but this meant that uh, other other frameworks, other authors of this webpack, and it became popular in other other frameworks uh, and in other domains as well. It's like uh, it's, it's this cycle of popular popularity. Yeah, right. Just sense. basically riding the wave, riding the wave. But I guess I, I do have another question. When it comes down to what you mentioned earlier, you mentioned that your book has like 400 pages. Has webpack gotten so like large of a thing that there needs to be like 400 pages worth of information just to learn webpack? Like webpack kind of came along as a tool to help developers kind of bundle their code. Now it seems like you have to kind of master Webpack just to be able to build certain applications. Is this true? Yeah, so the thing is that the, the book itself, it's the, the scope, it's, it's, it goes like beyond Webpack. So it's not only Webpack, it's, it's more about actually, it's more like technique book. So I just happened to use Webpack to discuss uh, development techniques. And that's one reason why the book is so big. So it will be possible to write a webpack book that's only about 100 pages, 200 pages, but you will, you will skip a lot of techniques. And, and if you look at what's happening right now, we have these two tools that uh, are like zero config and so, and, and you, you pretty much can use a tool without doing anything. I think that's the trend. And I, I think you, in webpack four, you see, see the same ideas. So you will get more done with less configuration. So I guess the overall, Overall, overall trend is that uh, you get more done with less effort. But but if you have to do something really complicated, if you have to do something really advanced, then you have to understand the tool. Uh, and and from my point of view, whatever you do, it's, it's extremely valuable to understand what the tool and the, and the tooling frameworks, everything you are using, because one day there will be a problem that's that's so hard that, that you actually need to like dig into the what, what you're using. Uh, and really solve it. So I, I would say that, I mean, most of the book, you don't need most of the book. You need maybe the first parts, maybe you need a couple of techniques here and there. You don't need to learn. You don't, you don't have to learn the, you don't have to read through the whole book. You can just uh, read through the bits that are relevant to you. I wrote it in such a way that you can, there are like summaries and there's like a summary of summaries and there's, you can just save a lot of time by, by looking at summaries and figuring out if this applies to me. One of the things that I, you know, I was looking at the title and, you know, thinking about this topic, and it reminds me a little bit of Douglas Crockford's book, JavaScript, The Good Parts. And in that book, he actually, yeah. um, I don't know if criticizes is the right word, but he encourages people to do JavaScript in a very specific way and to not use certain aspects of JavaScript um, and, and to write, yeah, to write JavaScript in a, in a certain way. So, do you have this opinionated view then of of Webpack, or was this more or less just yeah. a, an encouragement to, hey, you know, pick up the parts that work for you? 
Yeah, so I mean, uh, of course, it's my my own personal opinion, but uh, I think that tool itself, the configuration model is, is let's say, it's a little complex. So there will be way to some ways to simplify. So you can you can kind of you can get a lot of a lot of tons out of the tool without using every feature of the tool. So yeah, I would say that find like understand the basics uh, and just just know what you don't know. It's like, uh, I mean, that's the thing. So you have to, this is why you have to read, this is why you have to learn new things, because when you know what you don't know, then you can learn later, but you can learn later about what you don't know yet. So it's like, you don't have to know everything at once. You can learn, learn bits, you can learn things as you go. So, but yeah, it's like, uh, let's just say that I might write uh, web back the good parts book one day that will be like a lot slimmer and it will be just the, like the, bits I think that are relevant or whatever. So it's, it's, it's like a, yeah, it's, it's a bit like that. Makes sense. So let's say that I'm a total beginner um, or I just, you know, I've been using Gulp for Grunt or something else. Um, how, how do I begin to approach this with Webpack? I mean, uh, I will just to write through the book because when you write through the book, you you get really big configuration at the end, and you will understand every piece of the configuration, and and then it's much easier to kind of get done what you want. Or another option will be to to go with like let's say create create React app. You pick that up, uh, then you e check, and then you try to figure out what, what what does this configuration do, and then you go to go to like uh, documentation and check out what the plugins do, what everything does. Because uh, at least in the past, the problem was that people they people took like boiler, boilerplate, so they they take boilerplate, they forget the boilerplate, then they develop for a while, then they notice that they need this and that, and now you get this problem that because now you have to understand what what's this web configuration about. So it's like, like at some point you have to just you have to learn it if you're using it. So, but uh, yeah, I would just say right through the book. And you will get it at, on on some level. So you also mentioned though that there were going to be like new updates and a new version that reduces the amount of configuration that you need to write. Is this going to like change the philosophy behind Webpack? And as far as kind of some of the stuff that's already been put out there, um, is it going to be still backwards compatible? And also, like you mentioned, that a lot of the stuff again is going to be pre-configured, but I'm assuming you can still kind of go in and do a lot of the more sophisticated things with Webpack. Yeah, so let's say we have this uh, like new tool, uh, Parcel, that's uh, that's zero zero configuration. So you can use Parcel without writing a huge amount of configuration, and and it this means that it it put it put some pressure on Webpack to do more or less the same. So this means you can do more more things out of the box, uh, and you get better configuration out of the box. One thing to note is that uh, that it, uh, up to Webpack, Webpack 3, we had this common JS plugin, uh, and no, no, common uh, common stack plugin. Uh, what I mean is common stack plugin is is a plugin that you use to extract commonalities between between chunks, uh, and it's it gets a little complex to explain and complex to understand. And so for this reason, we have something automated in Webpack 4. So we see this incremental updates that that make like Things that were complex in the past, simpler in the future. So we get like these little updates that improve the user experience a lot. So I think it's it's, it's very good, very good for for Webpack to have some pressure out from the outside, because when you have this pressure, it means that the tool itself has to evolve and become become like it has to serve its users better. And I think that's that's a great thing. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot better for people that are kind of coming into the JavaScript ecosystem in general, it'll be just one less thing to worry about. So as far, as long as this tooling continues to evolve and become easier to use, it's definitely a good thing. And I really agree with the innovation going on everywhere. It's good. I really am I'm glad to hear that Webpack is picking up some of that, some of those ideas, you know, because people, they, they latch on to these ideas and they start, you know, uh, coming up with their own things. And a lot of times it's, it's awesome to have all this innovation, but at the same time, if there's been a single project that everyone is kind of agreed upon, it's also good to kind of 
have a single place or a single like maybe main way of doing things because JavaScript doesn't really seem to have that these days in a lot of ways. We'll have like a hundred different ways to do something, which is good and bad. Good in the sense that there's a lot of innovation, but bad in the sense that all of these like great minds are not converging onto one project. Yeah, and I don't think that there's no shame in using old old projects. Like uh, today, I work with a project that uses Grunt, and I mean I don't have any pressure to update that to Rollup or or or, or web or whatever. I'm I'm happy to keep the project in Grunt because Grunt does the job. So I think it's like uh, just just using the newest newest tool for the sake of using the newest tool is not a good enough a good enough uh, reason to use the newest tool. So if the whatever you're doing right now it's good enough, maybe there's no reason to update. Or or if you can like uh, what people forget is that there are always like business reasons behind. If you can justify the investment, justify the time put into updating the thing, of course you can update. But uh, if it would be just space, if you would be wasting your time, maybe it doesn't make so much sense. So if you have old project just running on front, just give it in front. So are there particular plugins that you use on uh, Webpack that uh, that you really like, that you think people should at least have a look at? Uh, I mean, there's just, just uh, there's a certain, certain plugins like uh, HTML Webpack plugin uh, that exists in almost every project. Uh, of course, there's a common sign plugin, but uh, because we get the new plugin, maybe that's going away for most of the projects. I mean, that this is why I wrote the book, because now you will go, go check out the book and you will have all the plugins I, I like prefer to use. Because the one, one reason I write is that I don't have to rem, re, remember so much. So I write the stuff, I can forget it. So for this reason, I don't have a list of plugins for you to use, but uh, it's, it's all, all written down. It just depends on what you're doing. So I'm kind of curious. I know with React Native, we use something called the Metro Bundler, and it does something similar to Webpack. And I know that CallStack has created something called Hall that basically uses Webpack to bundle React Native applications, um, JavaScript, to have the bundle that React Native runs, uh, the JavaScript and the business logic. Do you know anything about kind of some cool interesting use cases that Webpack is being used for similar to that? Or, or even, do you know anything about that project in particular? You mean the React Native or, or like... Uh, uh, hall, uh, hall, the Packager Hall for React Native? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just know that there was some, some, uh, some let's say, issue in the past, that some, some discussion about in the past that maybe we should use Webpack to bundle React Native. My understanding it is that it never went anywhere. So React Native and Webpack, they're not, not. I mean, my understanding is that they're not so compatible. So that's why we have this Metro and, and whatever. So it's like uh, like a dead end at the moment. Uh, maybe just I don't know. It's the is from 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 my point of view, it's it's interesting that Metro itself, it's like a full plan bundler. It's it's like bundler that maybe could do more than just, but it's not like marketed as such. So Facebook doesn't market Metro as something that can do more than just direct native. But I, I don't know, it's just uh, maybe this is the conscious decision they made. So I but I more guess, direct native that, yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah. also I was kind of wondering, do you know of any projects like outside of the React and Angular ecosystem, I guess, that are using React, I mean, they're using Webpack, or do you know any interesting like use cases that people are using Webpack for that may just um, kind of spark some ideas and some of our listeners, maybe ways that they can use Webpack? Well, I, I can give you one really concrete example. So what I'm actually doing right now, I, I don't know if it's very really smart, but I, I decided uh, with some friends, like last August, we, it started as a joke, but we decided that we want a React conference in Finland. And what I, because I, you know, I do some Webpack work and stuff, so I, I have, uh, a site generator based on Webpack and React. So what I essentially do, I use Webpack and React to generate the conference site. And as it happens, it is, it's a very powerful combination. I mean, you have popular solutions like Gatsby. My my solution, it's, it's like completely different approach. I just get static output. But uh, 
I think like that that's one niche. That's one niche where Webpack is very powerful because when you combine Webpack with static site generation, this means that you can get like entire power of Webpack for, for this task. So you can do image manipulation and every every single thing that Webpack can do in, in a static site generation context, which is extremely valuable. Uh, and for me, this meant in my generator, uh, what I've been doing like last one year or two years, most of the develop development effort has been about just uh, throwing code away. So I have less code in my generator. I let, I let Webpack do more things. Uh, and it's just great because I have less to maintain. And it's just, uh, I, I push the work to the light, right place. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the cases where, where people can, can use Webpack more so they can generate in their sites instead of single page application or, or whatever they do right now. That sounds pretty interesting. So it sounds like you have almost, so you're saying that it does a website, static website generation. Does that basically mean you kind of have almost like a CMS type of interface where you kind of enter in certain things like headers and images and then the Webpack like basically takes that and creates an entire like web page with that? Yeah. Correct, correct. So this is where I kind of went my own way. I designed architecture based on, on GraphQL. So what actually happened is that I have a content repository on GitHub. And this is my, GitHub is my CMS. So I modified the content over, over GitHub. And this content it gets mapped to the content gets mapped to GraphQL API. And when I generate the site, it consumes the GraphQL API. So I, I have to stick, I have to couple the site layout from the content. I manage the content through GitHub. Uh, in the future, I might make like, uh, let's say you go to the site and I, I write a Chrome plugin and I, I have like inline edit. So you decide that I want to edit this text here and you, you like double click or whatever and you get the inline edit. It goes through the GraphQL and updates the GitHub repository, the content repository, and this goes to the API and this updates the site. So I could, in essence, I could do very integrated like editing uh, for for like the very kind of great great workflow that's integrated to the site with very little effort because I have this nice architecture in place where I have content repository and I have GraphQL and then I have the site generator and so, so on and so on and it all goes together so it's just uh, it's amazing what you can do these days with very little effort. That sounds pretty cool. I would love to see how you actually did that. Is that code available anywhere, or is that something that you kind of haven't open sourced or anything? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the the code code itself exists uh, online. Uh, what I'm actually missing is like uh, just a tiny bit of coding, uh, Chrome plugin. But uh, I will I will link you. I will give you some links which you can study, because I I think the architecture itself is is quite quite valuable and and, and good to study. Because uh, the way I see it is that if you think about uh, like static site generators, if you think about CMS systems, uh, there is like a very big overlap. And what's happening right now is that we see that static site generators they are becoming not so static anymore. So right. we get like something that's more like CMS experience, and I think this is great. It's it's just absolutely great. Corey, you've been pretty quiet. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I was I was just thinking about where I am on Webpack right now and how I went from being somebody who was deep into it and using it all the time to being someone now who uh, largely just tweaks existing systems. And maybe that's just a statement about the maturity of, of the things that I'm working on right now. But I'm thinking about how, to some degree, we're in a world where there's a decreasing need to be a Webpack expert because... There is Angular CLI, there's Create React app, there's Vue CLI. So there are these good tools that use Webpack behind the scenes that really take the pressure off of somebody needing to know Webpack well. Um, for those sorts of stories, do you think that it still makes sense for somebody to learn Webpack? And what are the sorts of things that you'd expect them to be doing in those cases? For you, the listeners of Ruby Rogues, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, 
costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, uh, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Yeah, so this is this is this one of the one of my points is that because we get we get new tooling, uh, new abstractions that hide hide uh, web back hide the complexity. It means that uh, you don't have to. I mean, some developers they don't have to understand the tool. But for instance, uh, for instance, uh, like uh, in one workshop, there was this guy. There was this uh, this someone from German, Germany that wanted to. I mean, he he was using Create React app. And then he did this great React app eject, and then he went through the configuration, and he was like, "I don't get it. I don't understand the configuration." So he came to the workshop just to learn what 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 the configuration does, what what does it mean, how does it work. So my point is that one day you might have to like go outside of this comfort zone uh, and and get something else done. And when that day happens, that's when you have to understand the tool. That's when you have. That's when you have to understand all the concepts. That's that's when you have to understand how does this work. And uh, it's like maybe you don't have to get it right now, but maybe you have to get it later. So I would say that uh, understanding is valuable, but uh, but uh, at the moment you you don't have to like get it right now. Maybe you can postpone it and get it later. I I tend to agree. I I like the idea of understanding the underlying tool, but yeah, if Create React React app will actually manage all the configuration for me and I don't ever have to think about it, then, you know, I can spend the time on learning other features of React or other libraries that are going to help me actually build features in, which is what my boss cares about. Um, The other thing that's interesting is Um, And and I keep bringing in information from Angular because I'm pretty hooked into that community. But uh, Mike Brocky, who wrote the Angular CLI, um, I had a conversation with him and with uh, Brad Green, who's the team lead over there. And Angular CLI is actually going to be moving over to Google system Bazel. And what they're telling me is if you haven't ejected from the CLI, um, it's going to be seamless. Like you won't even know that it switched build systems. And I'm assuming that Create React, React App and some of these others are pretty similar in that respect. So if Webpack isn't serving the need or they find something that interfaces more nicely with the command line tool, I could complete, I could see people completely replacing, uh, Webpack without even realizing that they're replacing Webpack because they just run their build through the command line tool. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, it's, it's a bit like, uh, if you think about the uh, Linux distributions. So when you have a Linux distribution, you have operating system and it has these little bits and you have a distribution that uses different bits. So it's like you have this layer or this cell around the bits that actually do the work. So it's just uh, natural that this happens. So what do you think is the uh, future of Webpack then? I mean, we, you already alluded to Webpack has seen uh, what the comp- competition is doing and recognized that the Configuration overhead is significant, so having better defaults makes a lot of sense. What else do you see on the horizon that's uh, interesting and worth getting excited about? Yeah, I mean that's that's very very good question. I I don't have like one clear answer. The thing is that uh, at the moment Webpack is it's very well well funded, so it's not about money. Uh, it's more about like how to, where to put the development effort uh, and. Uh, one of the nice things about the project is that we have a voting page. If you go webpackjs.org slash vote, you can find uh, what are the features that the community wants, what are the most popular features. So so this is the page that pretty much tells the future of Webpack because it, it guides the development, it tells where to put the focus. And just based on this 
pace, uh, there's like huge demand on better caching, so so that you get something like uh, faster builds and so on. Another big one, uh, handling of CSS. So in the past, uh, up to Webpack, Webpack 3, Webpack treats everything as as a JavaScript model. Everything is like like normal JS, and this is very pro problematic when it comes to CSS. And this is something that will eventually change with Webpack 4. Not in the first version, most likely, but uh, eventually it will change so that uh, Webpack does the right thing with CSS out of the box without huge amount of configuration that you have to understand. So we will get the uh, better usability uh, it, uh, and and just uh, and of course it's going to be faster. Uh, I think it's like uh, it it uh, more or less does the basic basic thing right. So now it's more about working on the edges, roughening the edges, making the edges of Webpack a little less hard, so people can it's just to make it a little easier for people and make maybe make it faster for people because it matters. Good stuff. Yep. So do you have uh, some favorite resources besides your book, obviously, that uh, you would recommend to people who want to dig a little deeper into Webpack or maybe a good video series or a course or something like that? Uh, yeah, the thing is, uh, because I don't have to learn Webpack, so I I really don't have to watch videos anymore. I, I'm sure there are lots of theories. Uh, I think the Webpack configuration, web, Webpack documentation itself, it, it it goes beyond beyond the book. Uh, there's tons of stuff, uh, and I'm I'm sure if you dig a bit, you will find other books and and like things like that. So yeah, I cannot like give you one direction. It's more about do a little research, find something that works for you because it's like. Sometimes what happens is that you find find some resource. Uh, it's kind of it's begins to make sense. It's, it's written or it it's, it has been in it has been done in such a way that resonates with you. So that then is a good good one for you. But uh, yeah, just to check out some stuff you can find online and, and see what works for you. It's more like uh, more like that. That makes. I sense. know that you mentioned um, something about. You all were very well funded now. Can you kind of go into more about how all of that works, just out of curiosity? Yeah, so essentially, at, at the moment, uh, Webpack is funded by the community. So we, we run all, all this uh, open collective uh, thing here, opencollective.com slash Webpack. And the way this works is that uh, companies or individuals that want to support the project, they can they can give certain amount of money per month to the project. And from here, uh, the developers they can submit expenses, so they do some some work uh, that has been justified, uh, and they can submit this as as an expense. So this is like one 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 way. It's like uh, like donation based model. It's not like a real business where you where, where you kind of get service or, or something like that, but it's like uh, it's something that's little. It's yeah, it's, it's one way to do this. So one way where people can donate and from where the money can be allocated. Yeah, I'm kind of looking at it now. I use Open Collective for React Native Elements. It's really interesting how transparent everything is because every time there is a, an expense, it kind of is just shown there to anyone to see. So, for instance, you paid someone $370 for a contribution. Then you have someone that's put in quite a few hours. They get $3,000. And I see right now that you have a budget of like um, over $200,000 for the year, which is really great. Because when you think about it, um, with the number of companies actually using Webpack, and um, Fortune 500 companies and, and, and companies that are just really big, the amount of money that $280,000 is isn't really that that huge in comparison. But I can say this is definitely one of the more well-funded projects that I've ever seen in open source. So either way, yeah, it's I mean, really it's, the, yeah, it's the best funded uh, projects in, in Open Collective. But I mean, now you have another problem. So let's say you're funded now. You have like enough money to do a lot of things. So how do you spend the money? 
I, I don't know what's the right way to do that because uh, the thing is for, for someone just paying $50 per hour might be like huge money, but paying $50 per hour for someone else might be too, too little. So how do you balance between like different needs, different requirements? Uh, and I would say that's the, that's, that's much harder problem than, than getting the funding. It, the, the real problem is managing the money, my, figuring out how to get most out of the investment that the people and, and the companies have made on the project. I think that's the, that's the really big problem. That's a good that point. That's like a, that a new can, problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a new problem. It's, it's like a good problem to have, but I would say it's, it's a very difficult one to solve. I don't know if there is one, one way to solve it. I will say it's a interesting turn, though, to hear you say that uh, money isn't an issue because it wasn't long ago that it was the biggest problem on Webpack. So I'm just glad to see that funding's uh, finally arrived. And I'm also just glad to see that the community has rallied around this tool. There's a lot of agreement that this is a place that it's worth uh, putting a lot of effort because uh, I think that's that's going to give us maturity. And that's a part of what I find interesting, too, is as a developer today, uh, I'm spending a lot less time with JavaScript fatigue and configuration pain than I did even just a year ago. So we've we've matured a lot in a short time, and part of that has been from uh, largely the community deciding that Webpack was worth standardizing on. Yeah, one other thing that I would add as far as like Open Collective and supporting um, different packages um, is that Webpack's one of those ones that you either use a command line tool. Um, or it's front of mind because you're configuring it yourself. But there are other utilities also on Open Collective that, uh, you know, that we should also be looking at and making sure that we're backing those up. Some of those are going to be some of these Webpack plugins that we're not thinking about or Babel, uh, which is used to compile your ES6 or things like that. Um, you know, just, uh, don't just focus on the, the top level tool, but, you know, if there's a layer or two deep that, that you're using, um, you know, make sure that you're, you're paying attention to that and that those are also getting funding. Um, cause I mean, imagine how tough our life would be if, you know, I, I'm using Babel as an example, but you know, if Babel went away, then what? Um, you know, or it didn't get funding and so we didn't have as many of the nice features that we tend to have in it. Um, so, so go look at some of the other projects that you use, some of the other plugins for systems like, um, Webpack. And make sure that those are getting supported as well. Yeah, but the, but the, uh, well, one question is that the, who should support? Because uh, I, I will I would say it's the companies companies using using the tools because they're making the profit out of the using the tools. So instead of blaming developers, uh, I will what I would like to do I would like to give like let's say one percent budget. For a lot of for companies to use on open source, so put one one percent in the project you're using, or in in the projects you're using in your work, because that one percent it's going to pay off because it means that the tools, the libraries you're using, they will get developed, they will get maintenance, they will get attention, and this in turn can generate more profits for you. So if you put some money back into the community, there's it's, it's likely that you will get get some. Uh, some outcome out of that. Of course, how do you how do you how do you measure the return on investment? How do you how can you tell that the money made difference? I don't know how to do that, but uh, I would say that it would be it would be very good practice if companies did this. If you put one percent out of your profit back into the community, you will make it a lot better. Well, and it's not just return on investment. I mean, th this is development work that people have put in for free or close to free that uh yeah. that you've are, you're already benefiting from and so i mean yeah, the other model true, is true. yeah the other model is okay i'm going to go build this utility and you pay me to use it and you know that's not the wrong model either but you know considering what it would probably cost if it were proprietary software um you know making that payment i think yeah. is well worth it yeah, I mean that's the thing. So, so someone, someone, somewhere is going to pay for the maintenance. Someone is going to use their time to maintain the tool or library, whatever you're using, and that's one thing. You can decide. I'm going to maintain this myself. I'm going to pay my developers to maintain it. But then over time, you know, 
knowledge that you're doing something that's outside of your core business. So maybe it makes sense to use the same money as your show. It's a bit like that. Yep. I've had long talks about uh, sustainability with uh, a good friend of mine, Eric Berry, who's the guy behind Codesponsor.io. And uh, so, yeah. yeah, these are all things that, uh, that we, you know, get talked about, I think, more than they really get solved. So I'm, 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 I, I have an interest in making sure that we're all paying attention to this and making sure that, you know, this work is actually supported and appreciated. Right. And it's super yeah. interesting now with Open Collective because it's the first way that I've seen, at least, where, like, there's been a platform that's kind of actually made sense. We use React Native elements again on on Open Collective, and we have um, now like bounties on our actual project where we're like, hey, someone that wants to do this can get this much money, and then they go in and they submit a pull request, and we pay them the money, um, and it's actually worked out really great. But I do still see the the issue, and I'm sure this is kind of just going to always be an issue to some extent, but maybe it can be kind of um, taken care of or manage better in the future or something will come along that will help this out. It seems like, like certain projects get an un, like usual amount of attention versus other projects. And, th- and some of those projects have like much more money than other projects. And I'm not calling out Webpack in any way. I'm just saying in general. Um, and it seems like a lot of that has to do with the people running the project. How good are they getting the word out? like Mm. almost like marketing or something like that. So I think like in the future, it would be interesting to see if someone or if, or if maybe open collective can help address that for some of these communities, because these people are spending all this time building. They don't have enough time to actually go around like, you know, making the case for people to contribute. Um, Or maybe that'll just happen organically with people as contributing back to open source financially becomes more, of a normal thing that that people start doing we'll see yeah yeah i, I think it's it's important to to separate uh, like like uh, like let's say i have hobbies projects so let's say i have a project somewhere i have something on github i'm doing for fun it's like a more like hobby for me I, i'm doing it because i like to do it i'm not doing it for it for money uh and let's say it's like one way to do open source and another, another way will be like let's do like Really commercial open resource. Let's do like let this let let's do this thing for money. Let's let's do it so that we can make a living out of it. So you have completely different mindsets. Because I mean, of course, there's some overlap. Doing something commercial can be fun, but uh, it's like uh, when you do something for fun, you just do it when you feel like it. But when you have something commercial, something that has commercial constraints, then you have deadlines. You have clients waiting. You have people waiting for your work. So it's completely different pressures. So it's, it's, it's just one, one uh, dimension to think about. Well, the other thing... So though, what is, I mean is that... Yeah. The other thing to keep well, in mind, was, though, is that I know plenty of people who have started it out as a as a hobby, and then a bunch of people started using it, and then it turned into a job. Yes, correct. So you can go from, from a hobby project to something commercial, but it's, it's super hard to go back. So once you have made something super serious and you have clients waiting... You cannot make it. You really cannot make it hobby anymore. So it's like uh, it's like one way street. Yep. Well, we've kind of gone off on a tangent here. Is there any other aspect of uh, Webpack that we want to dive into before we get to picks? Uh, I mean, uh, I cannot really think of any any far core. I think the thing is that people think it's super complex, but it, it's uh, it's maybe a little simpler than they think. So. So if you understand the basics behind the tool, if you understand the concepts, if you understand the language, it's like I'm learning German right now, and it makes a lot more sense when I understand what the words mean. So if you learn the words first, if you understand that this word means that, and, and so on and so on, then you start making sense of what, the, what these people are speaking. And I mean, it's not always like, it's, it's the, the thing is, once you learn the language, you learn that people are really boring. They speak really boring things. So it's the same thing with Webpack. So you learn Webpack and you notice that it's not so difficult, but it's not so hard as I thought. Once you figure out the concepts, how these concepts go together, how they work, then it begins to make more sense. It's like that. So learn the like alphabet first, and, and then you kind of then you start get then you really start to get Webpack. 
Awesome. All right. Well, let's do some picks. Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Corey, do you have some picks for us? Nat, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, um, I have two picks. My first pick is a blog post and a, a GitHub repository that kind of goes along with the blog post. Um, I did something configuring Vue to work with AppSync and GraphQL, and it's my first time using Vue, and I really, really enjoyed it. So basically, we're using a combination of AWS AppSync with uh, React Apollo. I'm sorry, not React Apollo, Vue Apollo and Vue, and basically, it's basically like a full stack React, I'm sorry, I keep saying React, <laughs> I'm so used to saying React, it's like a full stack Vue application with GraphQL, and um, it was really fun to, to learn to use Vue, and it was kind of, um, the project I think is a really good intro project, so if you've ever wanted to learn Vue or anything like that, check it out. Um, my other pick is, I think you may have spoken about this at the last show, it's Ready Player One. Me and my son are actually wrapping up Ready Player One together, the book, and we have been like watching the trailer for the movie and we're really pumped about it. So the Ready Player One movie is coming out soon. So that whole like book and movie combination, you may have heard people recommend it to you like a hundred times. And um, if you haven't read it yet, I would, I totally suggest reading it because it's really a really cool book. Plus one. Incidentally, that's also going to be the theme at ng-conf. So if you're into Angular, I know some people kind of mix and match their framework. So if you're interested in going to that, uh, going to be a lot of 80s themed stuff at the conference. Uh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Corey, do you have some picks? Yeah, I have a pick. Uh, so I listen to a lot of podcasts as well as being on a few, but, uh, one that I listened to recently that I really enjoyed was uh, by The Knowledge Project, or I should say that's the name of the podcast, is The Knowledge Project. And they had uh, Naval Ravikant on there. And Naval shared so much wisdom in two hours. I listened to it twice uh, within a few days of each other and took so many notes. So uh, I'll share the link. Uh, it's, it's two hours well worth listening to. One of the best podcasts I've heard just for uh, really life wisdom, business advice, uh, all sorts of good stuff there. So that's my pick. All right. Um, I'll jump in here with a few picks of my own. Uh, first of all, React Dev Summit is coming up. Uh, Juho is going to be speaking. Incidentally, so are um, Natter and Corey. So, um, and Kent, uh, the only person on this panel I haven't gotten a commitment from, and she's on vacation, is Tara. So, um, anyway, it's going to be terrific. Uh, use uh, Juho's code. That's uh, J U H O. Get ten percent off. And uh, yeah. Um, really appreciate all the people who are willing to speak at it. Also, uh, on top of Natter's pick, um, if you're interested in Vue, we have started a Vue podcast. Um, that's viewsonview.com. So I'm going to pick that as well. And, um, yeah, the, the last pick that I have, I've been listening to this book and it's, uh, it's a parenting book that shows what, what, uh, stage of life I'm in, right? Um, but, uh, Anyway, kids are hard sometimes, you know, it's, you spend time with them and, you know, you do all the things that you know that you ought to do as a parent, but sometimes they're still hard. And so, um, yeah, I picked up this book, it's called The Whole Brain Child, um, and it is terrific. 
And so I, I'm, I'm trying to implement some of the stuff that I'm learning there and, uh, you know, learning a ton. So, uh, I, I'm going to pick that. And then lastly, um, I've become aware that some of our listeners are not necessarily this show when I say our listeners, cause this show's new. Um, but you know, of the podcast that we put out at devchat.tv in general are entrepreneurs. And, uh, I just want to shout out about my business coach. Um, his name's Scott Beebe. Um, you can find him at businessonpurpose.com. And, uh, he has been a huge help for standardizing a lot of the processes and things around the podcasts. And so if you're, if you're looking for a good resource to help you kind of level up your business, um, he's terrific. So I'm going to pick him as well. Juho, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, I have one pick. Uh, Cham, Cham stack. Cham, like the thing you eat, stack. Uh, learn what it means because I think this is going to be the thing for the next two years, at least for me. So I, I will explore these uh, ways to write static sites in, in, in better ways. And I'm just putting a lot of time into this new site. I mean, simple site, but I put a lot of time and effort into architecture and just getting that right. It just, it blew my mind in, 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 in some sense, because uh, I cannot go back. I cannot write sites the way I did in the past. So now that I get it, how to do it, uh, it's just so much better. So, so you stack, said the jam, jam stack, right? What is that exactly? It's, it's a, Cham as in JavaScript APIs markup. Uh, Cham. And uh, then you have stack. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, just so look it up, figure out what's this thing. And when you get it, it's like, you're like, whoa, it's like that, that GIF where the world, like the galaxies explode. It's like <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, I think we uh, did an episode on it on JavaScript Jabber as well. I'll see if I can find a link to that. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, uh, Juho, if people want to pick up your book or, you know, if they want to just uh, stay in touch with you, you know, maybe Twitter or GitHub or a blog, where, where do they go for any of that stuff? Yeah. So I have this book site, uh, sort of chance to com you can find everything you need from, from that site it's it's full of developer interviews and stuff so just uh, check out the material if you like uh, maybe buy a book or two it's, it's nice and i also want to mention that we are doing this uh, react conference in finland at end of april react finland so react as finland dot fi we're almost out of the tickets so it's kind of pointless to market it at, at this point but i think it, it would be very nice so, yeah, that's it for me, I guess. Thank you for the invites. Yeah, thanks for coming. All right, folks, we'll wrap this one up, and we will catch you all next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c 